Good afternoon, and welcome to our final session of the Write Better Workshop series. As we've been discussing these past few weeks, we're learning how to expand your basic story idea because it's an important component in taking writing from regular to extraordinary. Through these sessions, we've been focusing on four key specific areas to help you learn to expand any fiction or narrative writing so you can feel confident you are writing the best to your ability. We began this story expansion series in the first session by focusing on learning to describe character emotions. Then we moved into the second session by focusing on setting. And last week, our session, which was the third one, which was discussing persuasion. Today, we're going to talk about the essential elements of storytelling. My name is Mrs. Adams. I am the Director of Curriculum for Lumos Learning. I will be serving as the host for our time together today. And it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for the day. Again, Mr. George Smith, and he works as a consultant with Lumos Learning. He is an editor and administrator and is the author of the Write Better book that we have been referring to throughout the series. He has conducted these workshops at a number of schools, and we're so privileged and excited to have him here with us today. But before I pass this on to Mr. Smith, I do have a couple of housekeeping tasks to mention. During the presentation, all lines will be muted. This allows others the best opportunity to hear all the content. However, we do want active participation. So at times, we will unmute individual lines so you can offer responses to Mr. Smith's questions. At any point in the presentation, you can type a question into the chat or use the raise the hand feature. And at the end of the presentation, we will have some time for questions and answers. Mr. Smith and I will answer as many questions as possible during that time. And if there are no other questions at this point, ah, which I'm glad somebody said, we can't see anything. So I'm going to give you a minute and see if hopefully that took care of the issue. I can see. Can you see the screen now? I can, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, girls, for letting us know. So, Mr. Smith, I am going to turn this over to you now. Okay. Thank you very much, Mrs. Adams, and hello, young authors, and welcome. This webinar will present several topics, not just one, but several, that you need to be familiar with to do your best writing, and you can see them there on your screen. The topics are logical content, redundancy, incomplete content, verbs in the active and passive voice, and verbs and their tenses, and lastly, grammar. And we'll go into each one of these in a little more detail, so if you, if you don't understand some of it, don't be worried about it. So let's begin with the first one, logical content. I'd like to know if someone can tell me, when they hear the, the term logical content, what do you mean by that? Uh, or the phrase that a story should be logical. What do we mean by that? You can raise your hand if you have an idea what logical content of a story means. Neil? It should be like true or something that could happen. It couldn't be like, like, like really unrealistic. Okay, good job. Okay. Yankee and Andre. If it, if it makes sense. Okay, very good. If it makes sense. Okay. All right, Mr. Smith. Anybody else? That's okay. it. Uh, I think those are very good answers. Uh, logic does, make, does mean uh, sensible. Does it make sense? And as far as true or could happen, um, that's very true, too, although usually a true story is referred to as nonfiction, and if it could happen but didn't, it's referred to as realistic fiction, and we're going to mention a little bit of that today, too. So my description of for a story to be logical, the reason it says reasonable up there is that there must be a reasonable or common sense connection among the events in the, that make up the story events being in the plot, the descriptions and actions of the characters, and the setting. There should be a reasonable connection between all of those for a story to be logical. And you can see that demonstrated very nicely in that triangle 
uh, that shows uh, how these items should be together in the same unit. So now we're going to look at some examples of illogical content in a moment. It'll help you realize what is illogical versus what is logical. But first I'd like to, to mention a couple of points. When is logical content important in a story you're writing? Well, if you're writing a fantasy, that is something that's not based on fact or realism, you really don't have to worry too much about whether it's logical or not, because you might have a spaceship with a bunny rabbit in it, and uh, that's fantasy, but it do anything is possible, and it doesn't have to be logical. But if your story is nonfiction, that is based on events or characters that are real, or an incident that really happened, or what I call realistic fiction, based on events or characters that did not happen, but actually could happen, and that's what the young man said earlier when he was answering this question, then you as an author have a responsibility to your readers to make sure that the content of your story is logical or realistic. Because if you don't, uh, if you're not careful about that, your readers could lose confidence in you if you're not, if you're misrepresenting facts and not believe your story. And that's especially important if you're writing about persuasion, which we talked about last week. You want to persuade the reader to accept your opinion or point of view, but if they suddenly see things in there that aren't logical, you're going to really lose your credibility. You're going to interfere with their ability to um, believe you and to take any action that you want to take. So let's look at some examples, and we'll see if the content, if you think the content is either logical or illogical, and after we see uh, each example, I want you to comment and tell me if everything is logical or if it isn't, what isn't logical. Okay, Mrs. Adams, let's see the first uh, example. I'd like you to take a minute and just read the, this paragraph, and then um, I'll ask you the question. Read and think about if there's anything in there that's not logical, or is it all logical? Okay, when you're ready, just raise your hand. Neil, go ahead and give us your idea of what you, if you think it's logical or illogical and why or why not. It's illogical because the, you can't see the Empire State Building, the Statue of Liberty, and the Golden Gate Bridge, since so the Golden Gate Bridge is in um, California, so it's illogical. Good job, Neil. Mr. Smith, what do you think? Yes, um, the part that's illogical is the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, I've taken a gray line cruise around Manhattan, and you can see everything else. You can see the Empire State from the, from the water when you're going around the island of Manhattan. You can see the Statue of Liberty, and across the river you can see, North Airport is right there, so you can see planes taking off and landing. But she is correct. The Golden Gate Bridge is not in New York City. It's in San Francisco, and I thought that that would be a well enough known fact that even if you were not from the New York area, you probably would realize, you probably heard of the Golden Gate Bridge and might know where it is. Anybody else see anything else? Okay, let's go on to example number two. And again, I want you to read through it and then uh, raise your hands if you see something logical or see something illogical or whether you think it's all logical. Okay, when anyone is ready, please raise your hand. Okay, we have a few hands. We give just a few more seconds for those who are still reading. Okay. Okay, I'm going to unmute this line. Emily, what do you think? Illogical because the cell phones were not invented until after World War II. Do you okay, remember what? what years World War II uh, was fought in, Emily? Do you remember what time period? No. Okay, but you're absolutely right. Uh, that's the right answer. But you must have had a feeling then that World War II was, was back uh, a good number of years ago, even if you might not remember exactly what years it was born. Is that right? Let me unmute and see. Yes. Okay. Anyone okay. else? 
Okay, well that's certainly the correct answer. And if you actually wanted to uh, check it out for certain, you could just go on your internet and Google World War II and you would see that uh, it was in the 1940s. I think it started 1942, I think, or maybe 40. But you'd see it was 1940 or 42 through 1945. So if you wanted to be absolutely sure, you could double check that. The cell phone, as you would expect, actually, I didn't look up when it was invented, but it certainly was invented um, very recently. Here we are in the year 2000. It might have been the 1990s, but certainly way beyond World War II. So thank you. Your, your answer is correct. Are we ready for example number three? I think so. Here we go. Okay, same procedure. We'll read this one out loud this time for something a little different. Hi, my name is George, and I have a funny story to tell you. In 2005, when I was in the seventh grade, I got a Wii controller for my ninth birthday. One day, while my mom was watching me play the Wii basketball game, she asked me to let her try it. You won't believe what happened. Okay, Neil raised his hand. Thank you. It's illogical because the Wii wasn't invented in 2005. Do you remember when it was invented, Neil? No, I think in 2006. You are absolutely right. Anyone else? Okay, Neil, you're absolutely right. And here again, uh, if you needed to check that first, just to make sure, you could go and Google Wii, W-I-I, or the company that invented Wii was actually Nintendo, which is a games producer. You could have looked up either one of those, which I did. And in one of those um, Google searches, you would find out that the Wii actually was introduced in 2006. But uh, Neil, you guessed it correctly. And um, that's right. It is illogical for that reason. OK, we're going to uh, leave the subject of logical content or illogical content. And now look at another topic for today, the topic of redundancy in a story. Can anyone tell me what does it mean if someone says that there's redundancy in a story? Anybody know? OK, girls, what do you think? Um, it means repeated again and again. Repeated again and again. Good job. Right. Anybody else? I think that's it. Okay. Um, I'm going to, I think that was a good guess, and, but I'm going to expand it or rather narrow it down a little more than that. Um, what it means to me is that not, uh, sometimes repeating again and again can be okay, but what it means to me is that more words or phrases or sentences than necessary have been used to describe an event or a character or a character's action or a setting. If I say it another way, it means there is unnecessary repetition of a thought or detail because common sense tells you it's obvious that the reader will have already understood it before the author has finished describing this in the story with words, phrases, or sentences whose meanings are very similar to what the author wrote before. So, as I said, sometimes when you repeat something again and again, it can be for emphasis, it can increase drama, uh, but in many cases, it, it is uh, the use of more explanation than is really necessary. In other words, hey, the reader got this already the first time you said it, and you really don't need to say it in different words uh, again or again or again. So I hope that um, makes it clear to you. But again, make, the point is when you repeat something again and again, it can be redundant where sometimes an author can be repeating something uh, to build suspense or to really make sure he, he or she drives home an important point. But we'll get a little better idea than that because um, we're going to go into some examples. And the examples that we discuss are intended to help you recognize and eliminate from your writing words or phrases or sentences or paragraphs that aren't necessary because your reader has already figured out your message without the additional explanations. 